of people today. We only have 58 here. Some uh, absenteeism. So this is a narrative lecture day to help set up the uh, discussion both on Wednesday and on Monday. Wednesday, happy you guys have been reading the Jamie article, happy you guys are reading the uh, Becker article, and then uh, a week from today we'll have our uh, first of a couple uh, primary source discussion day. So in the <clears throat> the Ricordanza diary, written by a Florentine merchant named Gregorio Dati, talks about all the wives he runs through and the many, 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 many children he has and his business successes and more often than not failures. So that's a week from today. And uh, the Jamie and Becker on uh, Wednesday. We're going to still do the. Uh, we're going to do the. Uh, Wiki thing again, but uh, half of you guys will be doing the Becker Wiki, half the, the Jamie. So anyway, that's all pretty straightforward. Today is about probably the most famous city in Renaissance Italy. Uh, the city that becomes a, a, a powerhouse because of its wool industry. It uh, is in Tuscany, it's not far from Siena north of Siena. It's nestled in the, uh, the Tuscan Hills. Siena uh, is down here. And uh, there it is. Pisa's up to the north, uh, Luca up to the north, Perugia down to the, the southeast. And uh, <clears throat> it was uh, originally a, a Roman colony, Florentia. And you can still see in the, uh, 
in the city the original Roman foundation on the banks of the Tiber River right there. Most of the city is on the north bank of the Tiber River. Arno River, Tiber's in Rome. Uh, north bank of the Arno River, you see right there? Nice little grid squared off. That was the original Roman Florentia. And over the centuries, the city expanded to the north and south of the Arno River. The population is never huge. None of these Italian cities ever had an enormous population. Naples was probably the biggest, maybe three or 400,000. But of course, this is a time when, when London has 10,000, Paris maybe 20. There just aren't big cities. And uh, Becker, on page 47 of his article, writes that one of the most important social facts concerning communal history is the influence of mass migrations upon the politics of the republic. Demographers agree that the upsurge of Florentine population until the advent of the Black Death was staggering. The city uh, is not a major player in the 12th century, but in the 13th and 14th century, because of its wool industry, becomes an economic powerhouse. And you can see the, the series of walls. There's first the Roman walls, and then the town expands out. These walls here are built in the late 1170s, and then in the late 13th century, a huge new circuit of walls because the population had outstripped the available space inside the walls. There's the cathedral, and here is the governmental center. And just as there was a Palazzo Publico in neighboring Siena, in Florence they have a similar town hall, complete with a very large tower, larger than any of the towers of the families in the city. That was significant, showing the, the power of the communal government. And it's called the Palazzo dei Priori, because Priori, or Priors, were the, uh, the executive council of the city. In 1282, about the same time that the Council of Nine is dominating Siena. A similar governing executive council comes into being in the city of Florence. You have nine councilors in Siena. You have nine priors in Florence. And just as in Siena, they serve very short terms in office because there's a fear of one person becoming too powerful and taking over the city. So they serve two months, just like in neighboring Siena. But whereas the Sienese Nove, the councillors of the nine, are drawn from a kind of cross-section of upper and middle class society. The priors in Florence come exclusively from the arti, or guilds. Seven come from the seven major guilds, the arti maggiore, and two, on a rotating basis, come from the 14 minor guilds. It's kind of like the, uh, the UN Security Council. America, Russia, China, Great Britain, and France all have permanent seats, and then the other two seats rotate throughout the membership of the United Nations. This, uh, this government is set up in 1282 because of the problem of factional violence. Chaos in the streets, families fighting each other, Romeo and Juliet style, is bad for business. And so the business leaders established this government. They build the palace, and in 1293, they drafted a kind of constitution for this government called the Ordinances of Justice. Becker and Najami talk a lot about this. It is a twofold uh, uh, document. On the one hand, it gives a kind of uh, legitimacy to this government, and it also excludes from governmental and civic participation these warring factional families. Some families are exiled, some are merely politically cut off from the system. 
And Jamie writes that the ordinances gave formal constitutional expression to the vision of the Florentine Commune as a sovereign federation of equal and autonomous guilds. We're going to talk a lot more about guilds in just a second. The oddity. He also writes that faith in the collective wisdom of the members to discern the common good, initiatives emerging from such exchanges to mold the policies of leadership, such were the ideals of guild republicanism. And Thacker writes that by the end of the 13th century, therefore, any effort to distinguish between guild interests and communal policy was foreign to the mentality of those who sat in the council halls of the republic. So what are these guilds? There's seven big ones. The Arti Majori. The three most important, which are all interrelated to each other, is the Wool Guild, manufacturing of wool and cloth, the lana, the exporters of that finished cloth, the Kalamala Guild, and then the Bankers Guild, the money changers, the cambio. And these three have a symbiotic relationship. The banking industry began because of the need for these merchants traveling outside of the city to have access to capital that they didn't have to carry with them in a big sack of money. The Lana Guild, the Wool Guild, is the engine, but it's entirely reliant on the exporters and the money changers. This is the big three of Florentine society, economically and politically. These are the three most important guilds, and the priors that come from these guilds are the three most important priors. There's four other major guilds. There's a, a small silk industry. There is uh, the leather and fur industry. And then you have two uh, kind of professional guilds. One for uh, basically the medical uh, field, doctors and apothecaries, and uh, then the uh, legal professionals, judges and notaries. So each of these guilds has a permanent seat on the private. <coughs> the 14 minor guilds get two seats that rotate between themselves. But it all starts with the wool. The Wool Guild was founded at the end of the 12th century. And what these guilds are is kind of like uh, unions today in the skilled trades, like a plumber's union. A plumber's union exists for a couple reasons. One, to uh, control quality, to restrict the number of potential plumbers so that everybody has a decent amount of business, and to regulate the prices. The same thing is happening here. All the wool manufacturers belong to this. They carefully control who can uh, enter the industry, maintain standards of quality, and uh, control prices as well. And Giovanni Villani, the chronicler who told us the story about the, uh, the beginnings of the Guelph and Ghibelline conflict, uh, writes that uh, before the Black Death decimated the city and Europe in general, there were approximately 300 workshops producing wool and cloth in the city. Fully one-third of the population worked in the production of cloth. That's at a huge percentage. It's like Detroit in the 1950s in the auto industry producing 100,000 pieces, uh, basically like square yards of uh, cloth every year. Florentine cloth is valued throughout Europe as the highest quality and the most desirable, and it's sold everywhere. And the people who are in charge of selling it beyond the city are in the Kalamala Guild. And there is their uh, logo, which is an eagle carrying a bale of cloth. Founded somewhere around the year 1190, the same time as the Arte del Cambio, the Bankers Guild. Both of these are crucial to the expansion of the Florentine economy. Because it, the exporters carry the cloth 
across Europe, and the bankers set up branches throughout Europe. Here's how it works. You're a merchant in the Kalamala Guild. You don't want to carry with you a whole bunch of gold florin coins. A, you could get robbed. B, they're heavy, it's impractical. What you do is you go to one of the banks in Florence, member of the Cambio Guild, and you deposit money with them. 1,000 florins. They then give you a notarized legal document that says you have deposited X number of florins here in Florence, and when you go to London, or you go to Venice, or you go to Rome, or you go to Lyon, or any number of cities in Europe that has a branch of that bank, you can go into the bank with your notarized letter, and they'll give you the money. It's a credit system. It's a commercial banking system. And so these three guilds are intimately related to each other and totally dependent upon each other. The wool guild can expand and employ one-third of the population because there's a huge market for Florentine cloth outside of the city of Florence. The bank, the merchants of the Kalamala are able to travel very far and wide with uh, minimal financial risk to themselves. They don't have to carry the money with them because the banking guild has offices all over Europe where you can deposit money in Florence and then take it out somewhere else. This is a, a powerful economic engine. It makes Florence fabulously wealthy. Florence is probably the richest city in Europe uh, by the year 1300 because of this uh, system. The establishment of the Priorate stabilized the city. The exile of some of the warring families, tearing down their towers, normalize the business environment. Business doesn't like chaos. Business likes predictability. Business likes order. And the Priorate, established by these guild members, did just that. <coughs> Reduced the factional violence in the city, made it a more stable environment for the expansion of the cloth industry. And these major guilds had a headquarters in the city. It's right here. The Orsan Michele. It was formerly uh, a lot of things. Uh, an oratorio, which is a, a chapel for singing the mass. Or San Michele is a shortened version of Oratorio San Michele. And it's built at the end of the 1300s, right about the same time that uh, the prior is established, right about the same time that they build the Palazzo dei Priori as the headquarters of this communal republican government. And each of the guilds, major guilds, had a niche on the outside of the building where they could place a statue of the patron saint of that guild. The Cambio Guild enlisted the, uh, the famous <coughs> bronze sculptor Lorenzo Gilberti to uh, depict uh, Matthew, the writer of the book of Matthew, the evangelist, their patron saint. And this uh, was a kind of a place for the, the guilds to kind of compete against each other. Who can have the finest statuary in their niche? The Kalamala Guild also contracted with the best known and most well-respected bronze caster, Lorenzo Gaberti, to produce a statue of their patron, John the Baptist, who is also the patron saint of the entire city itself. And there's the Lana statue, again, by Lorenzo Gaberti of St. Stephen. So if you go there today, you can walk around the outside, and there are these niches with these bronze statues of patron saints of the various guilds. <clears throat> now, the, uh, the process by which you get from the sheep out in the field to wool and cloth is a, is a fairly long and involved one. First, you have to shear the sheep, as that goes without saying. And if you've ever gone over, um, how do you get there? You, uh, if you go kind of towards the uh, ferns and the sororities, but uh, don't take that road if you go back in that direction, that's where all the farm animals are. That's where we've got all the cows, horses, and we got a lot of sheep back there along that road that uh, is kind of between campus and um, 
uh, Fox Ridge. Anybody been back there to see all the animals? Yeah. Uh, I walk my dog back there. Uh, sheep are filthy. They are dirty animals. So the wool, once it's been sheared, has to be washed. And the way that Lana Guild worked is it, uh, they used a division of labor. So you had thousands of people whose job it was to simply wash wool, to scour it. That was the only thing they did. Then you need to uh, begin to separate out the fibers. So you had people whose job it was solely to take that washed wool and comb it, literally, with what looks like giant combs. Starts to, starts to separate out the fibers, because you need to separate the fibers out so you can eventually weave them into the thread that will be used to uh, uh, weave the cloth. Then you, uh, then you have to dye this raw combed wool, and there was a whole uh, segment of the Lana Guild that was in charge of that. It's a very, uh, very nasty, smelly process, uh, and then the more skilled members, the, uh, the weavers, take this now uh, dyed, cleaned, carded wool, and they, of course, as you might imagine, uh, weave what the spinners have spun into the final process. And the last step is, uh, is pretty disgusting. Fulling. You see, the wool, even though it's been washed and carded and combed, it has a lot of uh, uh, lanolin, a lot of kind of grease, natural product of the, the sheep themselves. You have to get rid of that. Well, this is a world that doesn't really have soap. It doesn't have detergents. So in order to get rid of it, the, uh, the Florentines turned to, well, they turned to Mother Nature and uh, bodily necessities. If you name Fuller, it's highly likely that at some time in the dim and distant past, one of your ancestors was involved in the job of fulling. And if manual labor is something you do with your hands, then fulling is pedal labor, because you did it with your feet. And P is the operative word, because in order to make wool soft and malleable, it had to be trodden for at least two hours underfoot in stale urine. <laughs> In the Middle Ages, wool became the country's biggest export. By 1300, there were 15 million sheep, almost three times the human population. So fullers would have been thick on the ground too, a vital link between weavers, dyers and cloth merchants. You could earn up to three times as much as a field labourer, and the work was so unpleasant that this must have been little comfort. When raw wool spun and woven into a loose weave fabric, it's left dirty. The grease is needed to ease the weaving process. It's after that the fuller has to turn this rough cloth into something more usable. Well, this is fine. Why don't they just put this on? Well, if you... You, you need to, to finish it. This is... When you cut this, it will fray. Yeah. And it's greasy. It is pretty greasy, isn't it? And it's... You can, you can make it better. It's a felting process. It closes the fibres together. Well, you can see that they are actually... You can pretty see widely apart like here, yes. whereas here, smooth and it just smells like cloth. <laughs> so how does this fully actually work? You need water, you need something to take grease out, and you walk about on this lot. Do you want to have a go? Oh, I'll definitely have a go. I'm really up for this. Okay, this is the upside. I get this nice, vaguely amusing costume to wear. And the basic job of fulling is okay, it's just a bit boring. You're just marching up and down and up and down in a vat for seven or eight hours at a time. The downside is that I'm marching up and down in this. This is genuine human urine. This isn't a television trick or anything, it's not orange juice or dyed water. It's about 20 litres of stale urine here. If this was petrol, it would be enough to get me from here to Newcastle. And it's been 
kindly donated by our production team over the last couple of weeks. Thank you very much, guys, for your help with the experiment. Now, of course, if you're in Renaissance Florence, one aspect of the fulling job is you have to go around and you have to collect the urine. So, uh, because they have no plumbing, they have no bathrooms in these houses, you have chamber pots. So you would go around door to door and collect people's urine. Very important job. Question. Would uh, all of these like jobs have the same workshop or do like different Um they uh, we do it in different places throughout the city. So um, one person own like all the places or like three? Well you have the guild master who's at the top of the heap, who uh, is kind of like a factory owner. And uh, would would control all of these processes, employing these different people who are part of the guild but not masters, from the washing, the scouring, carding, combing, all the way up uh, to weaving and spinning. And um, it was uh, a very hierarchical process, and one that uh, actually verged on revolution in the 1370s. The um, the the Chompy Guild. The carters and the combers were, uh, well, in the aftermath of the, the Black Death, there was a labor shortage because half of everybody died. And the, the chompy, the carters and the, co the uh, combers, took advantage of this uh, labor shortage to demand uh, full membership in the guild and to demand a seat in the priorate. And uh, they rose up in bloody revolution. Uh, a lot of uh, the good and the great of the city were killed, and they actually did get a seat briefly on the prior. Uh, a conservative reaction uh, ended their brief stay in the prior in, in the 1390s as the situation began to stabilize from the, uh, from the tumult of the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century. So, uh, all right, back to the earth. You ready, Ruth? I think so. Then, let's get into it. Oh, smells bad. Oh, it is. God, that smells. I was like, keeping that. It's like raw meat. Oh. I'm really not looking forward to this very much. It's every time you breathe in. Makes your eyes cool, sir. The flies are starting to get around. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite disgusting, isn't it? <laughs> well, I suppose we've had to take our shoes off. I've got my shoes off, I have to tuck my skirt up. I think you should, love. It's not going in there. Well, oh, every time you get a, a deep breath of it, you forget what you're doing and breathe in deep and woof. It hits the base of your stomach and you want to chuck. Yeah, let's go. It's cold. Oh, I could have walked that one, couldn't I? Was there a special technique involved in this? Well, the important thing is to get as much movement as possible. So, um, dancing is probably more effective than walking, but um, basically you keep moving. Yeah. And every now and then you have to stop and move the cloth. The important thing is it... to breathe. <laughs> and it's pretty vile. It's just so wet. Disgusting. Yeah. The reason they used urine is that when it had been left for a week or two, it decomposed to produce a rich source of ammonia, which is perfect for removing the grease. They didn't have public loos at the time, so part of the job would have involved collecting it from door to door. How long did they have to do this for? Was it really seven or eight hours? It depends very much on the size of the cloth, but it can, yes. I mean, it can take a long time if you want to really have it finish. The faster you move, the more we would get. <laughs> well, I don't know what you do about upset yeah. stomachs. The problem is, when you start to move fast, you start to breathe more. Yeah. <laughs> the feet of the fullers. Uh, uh, bad, just bad times. <laughs> a really unpleasant job. Do you changing the colour of the cloth at all? It's certainly changing the colour of the liquid. You can see the grease is coming out. It's gone very cloudy. It's taking grease out. The lines in it are going. It's like a bizarre version of a washing powder. The threads are actually closing up. 
and that I've hardly been at that at all. And you can see it, it's already different. It gets your toenails very clean. I'm losing the worst of this. <laughs> this really is the worst job. Mind you, in a strange kind of perverted way, I think I'm getting used to the smell. And the number seven hours, 59 minutes. So after all these miserable hours of urine treading, you'd end up with this, which would have been used to make something like this, worn by the knights and squires, and King Henry at Agincourt, and the bishops in their cathedrals. In fact, without this worst job, the big players in the Middle Ages would have been stark naked. Join me again next time as I slide down the career ladder once again in order to look at some of the worst jobs of the Tudor period. Guy does a, a series called Creatively Worst Jobs in Fill in the Blank, Middle Ages, Tudor England, Stuart England, Hanoverian England, uh, Victorian England. Uh, very, very amusing. It's a pretty show, obviously. And uh, I highly recommend you watch on YouTube. Yes, sir. Doc. Michael, you did touch here on the production of sheep. How were the sheep uh, raised? One or two sheep on a little tiny farm? Uh, a lot of sheep on the state? Well, a lot of the sheep actually live up in England. So they're importing the wool. There, There is some domestic sheep production, and, and uh, but a lot of it's in England. Um, in, in fact, at, at one point in the Middle Ages, there were uh, many times more sheep in England than there were people. Uh, you would have uh, large flocks more efficient that way. And what they figured out how to, to do in England that actually really helped the agricultural production is to use a three-field system where you have two fields that are in use and one field that's left fallow so the soil can recover. And they would graze the sheep on that field, the sheep then shit, and uh, fertilize the ground, and then you, you circulate it around so that you're uh, uh, getting great fertilizer, and you're recharging the soil, and uh, food production goes way up in the uh, 1200s and 1300s in England as a result, a lot of for uh, population expands, half of which die in the Black Death. But uh, that aside, um, and uh, of course there's sheep down in Italy as well. Um, but you need a lot of sheep. Uh, because really there's, they're not using cotton for cloth. Uh, um, all cloth is basically wool. Um, there's some leather being worn. Uh, but mainly what people are wearing is, is wool. And uh, England does produce its own wool, but, but the Florentine stuff is it's the sought out. It's the high quality, it's the high end, the expensive. But they do, they do produce a whole range from, uh, from kind of quotidian wool to you know, very, very luxurious uh, woolen products. So you have in Florence then <coughs> a, an interesting mix in which the government, and this is something that you're going to read a lot about in Becky and Jamie is a Republican government, but it's one that's dominated by business, by the guilds, by these trade unions, led at the top by the wool guild, the wool exporting guild, the Kalamala, and the banking guild, the Cambio. And beginning in 1282, they run the show. Now, eventually, big families will come to dominate, like the Albizzi family and the Medici family, the end of the 1300s and early 1400s. This basic system, though, lasts for a very long time. So it's very different than from Siena. It has some of the same features. You have a council of nine that's the executive council. They both serve two-month terms. They both build for themselves a... Uh, a city hall, a, a palazzo, right about the same time, around the turn of the year 1300, uh, meant to solidify their position and to, uh, to serve as a kind of symbol. And symbolically, they build the tallest tower in the city to represent their dominance over these 
warring factions. And in 1293, the Priorate uh, gives itself some written legitimacy by drafting a constitution of sorts. Again, the Jamie and Becker will talk about this in their, their articles. The Ordinances of Justice, which accomplish two things. One, they provide some legitimacy to this regime. And two, they exile and banish some of the problem children in the city, these great families like the Montagues and the Capulets who are causing civil disorder. They tear down their towers. They prevent them from participating in the political process and sometimes even going as far as banishing them from the city altogether because when you have people in the street feuding like the Montagues and the Capulets, the Montecchi and the Capulati, it's bad for business. It's chaos. Yes? What is the significance of towers? Did each family and its residents direct some? The great families would build a tower in their home. Uh, it essentially, it becomes a, a fortress, a place of last retreat in the event that things really get hairy. You go up in your tower, you close it off, you've got stores of food and weapons up there, and the bigger the tower, the kind of more powerful the family and more security you had. And these cities, Florence uh, and all of them, were littered with towers. Some of them still remain, a lot of them are torn down, either by these Republican regimes, or especially in the 19th century when they became uh, very dangerous. But they're, they're a feature of almost every uh, major Italian city, and uh, show the extent to which, in say the 1100s and 1200s, there wasn't really any public authority that uh, might made right. But in Siena, with the Council of Nine, here in Florence with the Priorate, you have an attempt to uh, quash this factionalism. And as we saw in Siena, so much of those frescoes in the Room of the Nine speak directly to disorder and the dangers of disorder and the need for harmony, the need for concordia. The exact same thing is happening here. The difference between here and Siena is that because Florence has this woolen industry in which one out of three people work, huge proportion, it's the industry that dominates the Republican government. And this is something, again, that uh, Jamie and Becker talk about uh, is, is, is somewhat unique to Florence. As we're going to see here in... Uh, week or two, when we get to Venice, you also have a Republican government, but it takes a different form because Venice doesn't really produce anything, but is rather a middleman between East and West, and it's the great merchant families who are the importer-exporters who dominate that Republican government, just as this Republican government is dominated by the Lana Guild, by the Cambio Guild, and the Calamala. Um, so, when you're reading the Jamie or Becker, and if you want to read them both, you certainly can, but it's not necessary. You just have to read the one you've been assigned, and then in the class, what we'll do is you will learn what Becker wrote from the people who read it, and the Jamie and vice versa, and we'll do our wiki again, and so you'll have a nice little repository for both articles, uh, as if you had read, actually, both of them. So that's all I have for today. Short day. So you can get out of here and read Becker and Jamie. Uh, if you haven't read it already, this little 1995 snapshot of Florence is just that. So uh, it kind of talks about it's a little textbooky overview of the city. Um, do take notes on your reading, either Becker or in a Jamie, and we'll do the same thing we did for Blanche. Uh, we'll go around, and uh, what I'd ideally like to happen is that if you if you did thesis for Blanche, you'd do primary sources, you'd do primary sources for Blanche, you'd do secondary sources, you'll kind of move down the line, and we'll rotate through so you're not doing the same thing every week, and you can kind of get a little different practice secondary source, primary source, thesis style summary, etc. Now, because um, we have, uh, well, the team, well, let me just say one more thing. The team that will do the summary uh, paragraph on the wiki will also get up and uh, walk the class through that article and kind of explain to the half of the class that didn't read it what the significances are 
etc. So that's Wednesday, and then uh, a week from today, on Monday, we've got a piece of uh, a primary source evidence, this recordanza from Gregorio Dashi. So do the reading, take the notes, and I will come around and check them on Wednesday. Yes.